How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvers and Dave Meltzer here, Wrestling Observer Radio, December 22, 2016, figure4online.com slash wrestlingobserver.com, nearing the end of the year. Lots of crazy things happening in 2017. We'll talk about a lot of that here in a bit. Dave, what's going on? No, yeah, I don't know. Just finished an issue, and uh, this is going to be... Uh, I already have next issue halfway done. Wow. Yeah, there's not going to be, there's not going to be. I had to cut a ton out of this week, and there's not a, um, there's not going to be a lot next week anyway. I mean, there's no, pretty much nothing other than, I guess there's a there's a big Dragon Gate show on Christmas Day, and that's pretty much it. Everybody else is there's pretty much nothing going on until, um, you know, I mean, I guess Raw and SmackDown next week. SmackDown show's pretty big, um, and then uh, the the UFC show on the thirtieth, which is an interesting show. Um, as we get closer, it's kind. Of, um, it's 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 just amazing. I mean, the whole thing because it's it's Ronda Rousey's return, and she's uh, refusing to do pretty much any media at all. I this could change, but as of as of this afternoon, she was not even going to appear at the press conference before the show. Intense training, sick no, of the she, media sick of the media so she's it's really you know i don't know it's really stupid when you think about it because i mean she's she's smart enough to know how she became a star and i can understand like the feeling you know there's you, you, you know when you when you're intensely competitive and you lose you start throwing around reasons that you lost and and one of her reasons was that she did too much media even though she really didn't do before that fight. She really didn't. There was there was like in Australia, there was like a ton of major mainstream media that wanted her that she turned down because it was fight week. And and nobody was saying that she shouldn't have. I mean, it's just like that's um, but she she didn't. It's not like she was running herself ragged like she was in her early fights for that one either. I mean, there was a lot of reasons that she lost in that in that fight. And um, I don't know that doing too much media was one of them. It could have. I mean, it could have been. But there's. You know, there's meeting halfway and everything, and um, you know, not doing the press conference. It's 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 a real interesting deal right now. I mean, she can get away with it, but you know, Connor didn't even get away with that one, and it's a real the it's a bad precedent to set. Uh, the one thing is, is that in the company, she's she's very well liked among the key people in the company uh, because of how you know she put the women on the map, and they kind of you know, but. I mean, not not promoting your fight um, is, you know, when you're getting paid based on that. But I think that there's really this feeling that that she didn't care about the money anymore because she's she's come to the conclusion that she's got more money than she'll ever need, and she was plenty happy when she was poor, and she was miserable this last year when she was rich. So that I guess money's not as important. So promoting hard to get a bigger buy rate is just not that big of a deal but um it's a bad precedent for ufc to set as far as um allowing that to happen and i mean the, the thing the other thing too is is i guess her feeling is is that the media turned on her and that's you know i mean i can i can get sort of sort of that if, if you're thinking like sh in a shallow way because like I, I, I was it made me think about something like i was talking to her a couple months ago i was talking to a pretty big wrestling star and we were actually talking about Twitter and, 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 and everything. And just about how it really gives you this idea of, you know, that, you know, bad, it gives you a bad idea of the public and wrestling fans and things like that. And I said, you know what? Probably 90% of my interactions are positive. You just remember the bad ones and the bad, and then idiots are there and they are there. And he, and he, he had plenty of idiots too. And, um, but I said, like, look, and it, and it was like an argument. It's like, no, everyone's an idiot. And it's like, no, you know, really, they're really not. Most people are very respectful. And then you get a few idiots. And it's like, and you deal with the idiots. You treat the idiots like they deserve to be treated. That's fine. You know, I mean, it's just, that's life. That's that's real life, too. Um, so I think in her case, again, like, there absolutely is media that was unfair to her, without a doubt. You know, like like they are people looking to push buttons and things like that. But by and large, I mean they, you know, she, you know, the media made her. 
or helped make her, helped greatly make her, and they're covering a sport. And I don't think most were unfair. I think that, they, you know, I think there certainly were some people that were completely unfair, and then some people weren't. And to just blanket everyone, it's like you blanket everyone and go, the media. Whenever I hear people say the media, it's like people say, you know, blanket anything. You know, like, it's like the wrestling press. And it's like you blanket the wrestling press, you're talking about people who have no clue, don't know what they're doing, and shouldn't be mentioned, and some people who are very professional. Or the MMA media, the MMA media is stupid. And it's like, uh, you know what, most of them are pretty professional. Some of them, some of them are... Some of them are definitely out to get themselves over and and make points that they probably don't even believe themselves and and and, and are babies crying for attention without a doubt. I know people like that in there, but most of them most of them are not like that. And to blanket everyone because there's those other ones. I mean that's a pretty unfair statement. And you know, but it's that's you know that's. You go in there and you get criticized and, you know, it's really interesting just watching, you know, it's, it's, you know, both of the top women stars, you know, Ronda and Cyborg both and, you know, how they have handled this last year. And it's, um, it's kind of too bad in a lot of ways. I mean, Ronda had a tough time. I mean, I've never seen anyone, everyone in sports loses and nobody's happy and she's ultra, ultra competitive. And, but to see, you know, it's like to see someone just i don't want to say change but but um just the reaction and everything like that to disappear and the whole thing and then come back and 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 it, it's just it's different and then cyborg it's just get, it's more and more ridiculous i mean she's out there and we talk about this all the time so she has these videos okay so this woman is by the way did you see the thing on outside the lines on cyborg no, this is the one where she was doing her weight cut. Yeah. 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 Um, but, I mean, they had a doctor there who basically said she shouldn't be fighting under 165. I mean, that's how, you know, I mean, this is the whole 140, 145 thing. I mean, she's just too big to be healthy, to be healthy cutting like that, cutting 30 pounds. And then they show her, and, of course, her whole thing of... Um, not being able to make 145 by Feb 11, and then complaining that they put the gave you know two other women shot at the championship, Holly Holm and Jermaine Deronda me, and then um, they show her. I mean, they didn't show her, but but there's other there's other stuff that that's been up there, showing her doing heavy power lifting, and it's like number one, the amount of calories it probably takes for her to maintain 175 is probably a lot um, of that kind of muscle, and heavy power lifting. And the problem is, is you're too big for, you're way too big for 140, you're way too big for 145, you're really too big for 155. Although 155 would be, I mean, most women, most women um, would probably be, if they were her size, would even though I said 165 would be healthy, a lot of women would probably cut to 160, because a lot of women do cut 15. Um, I don't think, you know, some will cut 20 which would get her down to 155, but very few really cut 20. Um, but if you're having trouble making weight, um, I'm just not sure why what heavy power lifting is the way to go, you know, to get your weight down. So, you know, it's just, I, you know, I don't know what it, you know, I don't know what it is that causes her to, to, to be like this. Um, you know, I mean, everyone's got their, their issues, but it's, it's really, you know, it's it's like I you know it's, 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 it's there's some mental thing. She she just has to get bigger and bigger, and then complain that she can't get her weight down. And, and you know, I mean, the whole thing when she signed with UFC, you know, the whole the the whole deal when she signed with UFC was she promised to make 135, and she would slowly lose weight and get to 135. And obviously, she never really took that one to heart. Then she complained that they try to make her cut to 140. Then she complained, you know, and it, it's, it's like, I, I, you know, I mean, I know that there's people that really in that company that are so sick of her that, you know, you know, just as soon as she was gone and, you know, she'll say that they were unfair to her uh, by making, by forcing her to cut so much weight. Um, and so, I mean, that's the whole gist of the, the thing there, but it was, you know, you watch that thing and it's. I mean, you can see, you know, you know, I've seen enough guys coming out of weight cuts 
where you look in their eyes and there's nothing there. And, and that's what, she, you know, when she was closing in on 140, I mean, that's what she was. It was it was ridiculous. And that's why I always say it's like if, if they want a weight class for Cyborg and they want to make her a world champion, and that's fine, make it 155. Why put her through this? You you know the whole thing is you want you want healthy fighters you want people to cut safely you all we all know like we all can pretend that cyborg isn't really that big and that she can make 145 healthy but it's bullshit she can't even if she can make it she can't make it healthy and isn't the idea to keep these people healthy all I know is the bigger issue is why are we making a weight class for cyborg why don't you just make a weight class at 125 so that a bunch of girls can fight at that weight. Um, I don't have an answer to that. My own feeling is is that that's what they should do. You know, again, if there were more, um, if there was a lot of women that were, were killing themselves to make 135, and it was just a healthy move to go to 145, um, that would be the case. But, I mean, there are, you know, just like, I mean, Holly Holm, basically, who's one of the bigger 135 pounders, and, and uh, Jermaine is as well, but... I mean, Holly Holm hasn't had trouble making weight. Misha Tate actually had trouble making weight the last time, believe it or not. And she had talked about how she would go to 125, but she had trouble making 135 in her last fight. Um, but, you know, Holly, you know, I mean, Holly Holm, when I saw, I saw her Saturday because she was in Sacramento. And she's, you know, she's probably 150, I would say. She was over, she said she was over 145. But she said that she could get to 145 tomorrow, no sweat. So to me, that sounds like she's 150, and she, that's what I would guess her weight as. Um, but, you know, it's like um, she didn't, like I was going like, are you going to feel healthier at one, fighting 145? You won't have to cut as much. And she didn't really, you know, it's like, well, I'm used to cutting. And it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't like, wow, if this is great, I don't have to cut as much. I don't have to watch what I eat as much. It was just business. It's like, well, I'm fighting at 145. It was, you know, like some people will say, oh, I'm going to feel so much better. You know, she wasn't even like that. So it wasn't like she was dying to fight at 145 or anything. It's just they needed a body. Um, you know, they needed a body because they needed a championship fight at that at that thing. And I think the feeling is, is that, you know, Holly Holm is a star. Uh, Jermaine obviously is not, but they need an opponent. And if they needed to make a championship fight, they could put Holly Holm in there. And at 125, they had no stars. I mean, they could have put Joanna, but Joanna's already champion at 115 anyway. There's nobody else at 125 who, they, who could make 125 right now who's as big a star as Holly Holm. Um, so that was the reason for the move is for that. You know, it's not like for the better division. The better division's 125, but it's for... What can main event a show on February the 11th? That's the thought. And for what can main event a show on February 11th, 145 is the better choice because you got Holly Holm in the in the thing, and Holly Holm's a you know a a, a name. Now Holly Holm and Jermaine as a pay per view main event, um, especially because they've been unable to really put together any other fights. I don't anticipate that that doing well on pay per view at all because I don't know how. Um, I don't know how much interest there's going to be in Holly Holm as a pay-per-view draw for a fake world championship because people won't take it seriously against someone that people don't know. I mean, I still see Holly Holm. I mean, she did draw against Shevchenko, but the, there's a very different mentality of television ratings draw versus pay-per-view draw. And you know, it's like Paige. I don't know that, like, like Paige obviously proved that she's a, a great television ratings draw. Um and but I don't think that if you put Paige and Michelle Watterson on pay per view, that that would have done any kind of numbers. Um, but you know, so I, I think Holm and 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 Darren Dami is probably as far as a Fox show or an FS1 show, it's actually a great main event as far as numbers. But for pay per view, I think it's going to be tough. But what can you say? There's no other alternative. You got to do the best with what you got. You don't got anything else. Um, there's a lot of fighters right now who are very unhappy about. A lot of things, you know, feeling underpaid, and people aren't doing them favors. I mean, if it was a year ago, they would not have had nearly as hard a time filling this February show because there'll be there were, there were very loyal guys who were loyal to the company, who thought the company would always take care of them, who would just go, you know what, 
you know, I'll give up my Christmas. I'll, um, I'm a little bit hurt, but you know, it's a pay-per-view main event. I'm going to make hundreds of thousands or a million dollars and you know, I'll, I'll do it. And, and now those same people are just going like, you know what? I'll still make that a month from now. And I don't know many favors, you know, it's not Lorenzo anymore. And, and obviously with Chuck being cut, you know, that Dane doesn't have the influence he used to have. So there's no loyalty to area Manuel. And, um, so that's another reason why they're having, a, you know, they had so much trouble. And it's, you know, when things fall apart, and it's going to be tougher. It's going to be a lot tougher. Because one of the things also that's um, going to be evident come early next year is they don't got Joe Silva to pull rabbits out of their hat, and, out of, out of the hat anymore. And that's no offense to Sean, but Sean can't. Sean, Sean Shelby is, a, is, is really, really smart when it comes to fighters. Um, fighting ability, he's very experienced as a matchmaker and everything like that. And, you know, dedicates his whole life to it. But he's he's only one guy, you know, and then Mick Maynard who's come in is, you know, new and has got to learn the system and it's and you know, Joe did the work of many people because it was, you know, and and that's you know, it's gonna be it's gonna be pretty uh I think I, I don't think it'd be evident to the public. But I think that to us, it's going to be real evident when situations happen and injuries happen at the last minute. And um, you got fighters who aren't going to be as willing to uh, sacrifice uh, or, 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 you know, do favors for the promotion. And you don't got guys that are going to make sure that when these disasters happen, that they're going to plug the leak as quick as possible. So, um, yeah, going to be an interesting 2017 in UFC. We have a show this weekend, although it's not a new show. So, yeah, so this is, this is you know, as far as um, the UFC, I, I think this, it's, it's a really smart move. This is one, this is a real big one, in the sense that the show on the 10th, which was a hell of a show, they're going to do a two-hour special on Fox from 8 to 10, primetime Saturday night. Granted, it's Christmas Eve. So Christmas Eve is obviously death for ratings. I don't know what, what Fox was going to put in there, but it's still Fox prime time. It's still going to be, you know, whatever it's going to be, a million, two million viewers. Um, I don't know if it gets two million viewers. Probably won't, but, you know, maybe a million and a half viewers. Um, and they're going to show, I mean, the one problem with that last pay-per-view is it was a it was a great show, but very few people bought it. So the... Uh, Choi, um, Duho Choi and Cub Swanson fight, which was, you know, one of the best fights of the year, one of the best fights in UFC history. It wasn't seen by that many people, so they're going to put the Duho Choi Cub Swanson fight on. They're going to show the Lando Venata and John McDesi fight, which had perhaps, you know, the best knockout of the year, certainly a candidate by the Lando Venata spin kick. It's tremendous. They're going to show the Cerrone, Donald Cerrone and Matt Brown fight, which was a great fight. And they're going to show Anthony Pettis and Max Holloway, so people will see Max Holloway finish Anthony Pettis, which will, a lot more people will see Max Holloway uh, get that big win, so it'll help Max Holloway, because they need, um, you know, he's going to be headlining a pay-per-view most likely against Aldo at some point in the early 2017. So, um, you know, I, I think it's it's great that they, that Fox was able to, and they were able to put this deal together, and that they were able to, make whatever deal they had to make with the pay-per-view companies because by contract this shouldn't be allowed because there's a 30-day window so they shouldn't be able to put any of this on television until after january the 10th but they're getting it waived so it could be on fox and i guess it's good the pay-per-view companies there's not going to be i mean how many buys are you going to get on pay-per-view for a fight after you know christmas anyway not very many and it's it's to everyone's best interest that they were able to put this together um but they were. I mean, that was a pretty cool move. So the official changes to the unified rules, I guess, are going to effect in 2017, including my long-feared added rule. You can now grab the clavicle. We'll talk about that. That's horrifying. <laughs> That's Why do we need that rule? I don't know. You know, of all the rule changes they did, when I heard that one, I was thinking the same thing. It's ridiculous. Like, it's like, it's like, what positive is this rule? None. There's not one positive, except I'm going to stop watching MMA if people start grabbing clavicles. 
Well, they probably won't do it that much because they there was no rule against it for years and years and years, and nobody really did it. But I don't see like you know like as far as like the the downed fighter rule, you know where where you 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 can't put your hand down when you're standing, and oh now I'm down, you can't kick me in the face. Okay, that was a gimmick rule that was um you know in time it was one that needed to be overturned, and they did. So that rule made sense. Um, the 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 open hand essentially there's a rule now that if you are kind of pushing to the head you use your hands to push to the head you've got to close your fist because too many people are getting their eyes poked that's a good rule we do not need eye pokes in this sport they're, they're going to happen but any rule that cuts down on eye pokes to me is is a great rule i mean i it's almost it, it got so bad that i almost wish they were there was a point where i almost wished that like fighters were allowed to wear goggles because there were there's too much eye poking and eye poking is just it just sucks in every every way shape or form plus i mean like usually you know you get poked in the eye and it's not too bad but there are examples of guys who have been poked in the eye where it's real bad guys need surgery the next day and i remember justin wilcox um oh it's horrifying um so anything you know anything that lowers so, you know that's like a good rule yeah the clavicle rule i, I didn't understand um, the other, what's the other rules are, um, hold on, what do we got? Um, or 10 seven or ten eights and 10 sevens, although we'll probably never see a we'll 10 never, seven. We'll, we'll, we'll probably never see a 10 I shouldn't seven. say never. I've seen fights where, eh, maybe you could think about a 10 seven. They'd be very, very rare. 10 tens yeah. here and there. Yeah. Okay. So the heel strikes to the kidney, making that legal. Honest to God, I, um, I don't know why we need to legalize that either. Um, I'm not like, I don't care one way or the other. But, you know, it's, I, I, I don't know that they, I, I don't know. It doesn't, I'm not, I'm not, uh, I don't think that like, I don't think like the fight loses anything by having that banned. I don't think that the fight gains anything by legalizing it. So I, um, you know, I, like I'm not a fan of stomping the feet and now you can stomp the hands too. I mean, I'm just not, I mean, I don't, I, I, I just doesn't feel like a, it doesn't feel like a, a, a fighting tactic. It feels more, you know what I mean? You know, it's stomping a guy's foot, you know, especially when you're fighting barefoot. I mean, it's not, it's not like people are getting broken feet left and right, which if they were, they, you know, you would probably think more about it. It's not like it it's really makes a difference in a fight. It's not like a lot of people use that. But I'm not really a fan of, of people stomping on the feet. And so now, if you have one hand down on the ground and you're standing, um, which is probably a position that you're almost never going to see, the guy is allowed to stomp on your hand now. So that's a new rule. Um, so the judging criteria is now based... So, so when, when, it, when, it, when you're judging around, you are supposed to base it on just these two things. Effective striking and effective grappling. All the stuff like octagon control. I mean, it's like, really, no. Okay, so... And if the fight is... Let's say the fight is 90% grappling. Then it should be judged 90% on the grappling. If it's 90% stand-up, it should be judged on the 90% that's the stand-up. So that is what rounds should be judged by. Now, if it's one of those rounds where nothing happens, and nobody had an edge standing, and nobody had an edge grappling, and it, nothing happened, um, then you go to um, aggressiveness. Whoever was the most aggressive. And if that's even, and you can't make a ruling on that, then you look at cage control, octagon control, at that point. So that's what the the, the deal is. And as far as the 10-8, uh, the 10-8 is going to be determined by damage, positional domination, and duration. And you want generally two of those three. So if you are damaging a guy, if you have done significant damage, and you have and you have positional domination when you're doing it, that should be a 10-8. If you are doing it for the entire round, and you're not doing a ton of damage, but if you have positional domination for the entire round, basically like back control or mount the entire round, but you don't do a ton of damage, that's still supposed to be a 10-8. As long as you get two of those three elements in there, or or perhaps a ton of one of those elements. I mean, if you just dominate, if you dominate the whole fight, but it's you're you're in guard, generally, no, you need damage in there. So, um, well, if you're in that guard doing kidney kicks for four minutes, that's some damage. Um, 
And it depends on how much damage it is if you're in there. Yeah, but and you're, you're on your. I I don't know that you're going to be seeing ten eight rounds from where the guy on his back gets the ten, the ten eight though. Um, it under, does seem unlikely. Yeah, I mean, I can see. You know, I, plenty of times we've seen guys win rounds from their back, and and there and there are situ- there are absolutely situations where guys should win r- rounds from their back because they're winning the round, they're doing more damage. So, um, but but they want a lot more ten eights, um, and again, ten sevens if. If there's multiple knockdowns and it's essentially if you think that the I think that the basic criteria is if you think that the fight really should have been stopped and it wasn't, that's probably a 10 seven. And we do see that sometimes. It's rare, Absol- but it does happen. Mm. I wouldn't even say that's rare. We Actually, there fights. was one this weekend. We see fights that uh, which which one? I think in that uh, you could almost argue the first round of that Faber fight. Oh, yeah, you could you could. But you know what? I mean, John was right there and. Pickett was never out of it. Um, I, I mean, certainly, if it was a... If like it was a, another referee, was I another could referee. I could see another referee potentially stopping it. But John's oh, a great I, referee. Well, it's not that. It's You know what it, you know what it is? If it was like a, a young fighter who's early in the game and early in his career, I think that, it, it, you know, you stop... You, you know, the whole thing is protecting fighters. If you If you see that it's an experienced fighter who's... Getting pounded, but he's not hurt that bad, um, and he's protecting himself. And he's still fighting, which because because the thing is, Pickett never stopped fighting. Now that fight was very close to being stopped. You know, I'm sure I haven't talked. You know, obviously I don't know what John McCarthy has said, but I was watching it, and it's it was it to me in my head, being right there at ringside. I was on the verge, but I never was like it's got to stop right now. But it was definitely something where you could you could do it. Now if that was in the prelim. Um, I think you would pull the trigger quicker because you don't know, you know, the experience level of the guy, and he's th- the guy's taken a real pounding. But the thing was, is you know, Pickett was, you know, he was always fighting. But that was a ten eight round. That wasn't a ten seven round. Um, you know, I mean, I and then all three judges had a ten eight, and I, you know, I didn't even think that that was a ten seven round. I mean, there have been a few rounds here and there. I think that that. Uh, in the Gray Maynard Frankie Edgar first fight round one, that was a ten seven round, I think. Um, but I think that the judges only gave it ten eights. That that but that was that's a very because there's multiple knockdowns and you know all that. All righty, some upcoming UFC matches that are not happening. Yeah, so they they they've been trying to make matches. Um, They've been trying to make a whole bunch of big matches in the last couple of days, and it's all falling through for all the reasons that I said. And we will be hearing more and more about this for all the reasons that I said. I think a lot of people don't realize how much different it is without Lorenzo Fertitta there, um, and just the attitude. And it's you know just you know then the attitude of the fighters. So let's see. So they they wanted to make we already, we already know about Aldo and Holloway. So um, Holloway's ankle is all messed up all swollen, and he can't fight. And Aldo's making fun of him because, if you remember Holloway's interview, it was about how, well, you know, we don't know if Aldo's going to show up. And then Aldo's go, you know, I'm ready to fight him, and he's the one who's not showing up after he cut that promo, which, in fact, is true. And Holloway's explanation is, is that, well, when I cut the promo, it was right after the fight. I was all excited, and I had no idea how much da- I just was told to say it. And I had no idea how much damage it was, and the and I thought it was ten weeks, so I could sit two weeks out and rest, and then have eight weeks before the fight. Well, it was only eight weeks, and I couldn't take a couple weeks off, and he still can't train, so there was no way he should have been fighting. But you know, again, if it was another year, or perhaps I mean, I've seen guys that would would do that because the company asked him. Um, so that fights out. So then they talked about, um, of course, the the fight with Khabib Nurmagomedov and Tony Ferguson. So that fight is not happening because Tony Ferguson wants more money, a lot more money. So they're having a contract issue there because he feels that he deserves a lot more than he's making um, for such a big fight. Um, So that's out. So they tried to make Khabib and Aldo. So Khabib turned that one down because he just felt that, why? You know what I mean? It's like he just felt that, Aldo was too small for him. Now I'll tell you what I think Aldo, I think Aldo has a hell of a shot against Khabib. Um, you know, I mean, better than better than anyone Khabib's ever fought. I think he's got more of a shot, honestly. 
So I don't know. I'm not saying he would beat him. I would fa I would favor Aldo actually in that fight. But it, I mean, I could see it going either way. But it's not a one sided fight on paper by any means. So, but Khabib turned that down, saying that he doesn't want to fight somebody smaller, and he wants Ferguson or he wants Connor, which you know, I mean, he thinks those are his two big fights. Um, I'm not sure that. Khabib and Aldo is any worse than Khabib and Ferguson as far as crowded interest goes. Although, you know, either one either one's a hell of an interesting fight. Um they were there was talk of Khabib and Nate Diaz, which I think would be a fairly big fight, actually. And Nate Diaz said that if they're gonna call me, they better offer me twenty million dollars because he's not interested in fighting anymore for anything less than that. Because Nate is rich, and Nate doesn't need to fight. And he said that uh, he doesn't he doesn't care about fighting Connor for less than twenty million, because he's got his money and he doesn't care. It's not a big deal to him. Um, so that's the attitude that he's got. So anyway, we've got no new fights to announce in that among all those people. How exciting! Yep. Well. Um, so they're going to have a, a tough time making that third because because Connor obviously wants to fight Diaz because he Connor wants the biggest money fight possible, and I think number three with Diaz is a bigger money fight than anything else that he's got that that there is out there bigger than Khabib for sure, um, and and at least with Diaz he knows um, you know Connor Connor could beat Khabib if he can keep it standing because Khabib very much in the last fight with Michael Johnson showed. Um, you know, when they were standing, when they were standing, Khabib did not do the, that well. However, they were not standing that much, and Khabib beat the hell out of him when they were on the ground. I mean, in a, just ravaged him. And he didn't get tired. And if he can get Connor on the ground like that, as Chad Mendez, who's smaller than Khabib, did, um, you know, um, Khabib could, could win that fight. And he'd have to go five rounds, which is different than three. But the, the, the whole thing is, is, um, but again, um, you know, Connor's not fighting right away. Although Connor's kind of talked like, well, I I only said I wanted Christmas off, so he's he's kind of backpedaling about like taking all that time off um, from fighting. So and they of course need him uh, so, to fight. So we may be seeing uh, we may have seen, seeing um, who knows what we'll see. I mean, obviously he wants Diaz, but if we don't, if he don't, we'll probably see Khabib. Although if I'm Connor and Connor does call his shots, I would say if there's no Diaz, my shot to call would be uh, Woodley or Cerrone. I think Cerrone would, I think Cerrone would get hot enough that, that you would have a real exciting build, and Cerrone's real popular right now, and he's coming off some some, he's coming off a hell of a win, and Cerrone is vulnerable. Matt Brown still still I thought won the first two rounds of that fight. Um. So I and and I think of all the guys out there that there's that and and of course Woodley you've got you're going for the belt. But with Woodley you are fighting up you're fighting up a lot of size. Um, that's a tough fight uh, for Connor. I'm not saying that you know he is a he is a far more skilled stand up fighter than than Woodley, but Woodley hits real hard and and uh, and Woodley already Woodley already is such a big wrestler that that. I think that he may just be big enough to be throwing Connor around. Um, so, but but those are you know those are the different fights that are that are out there for him. Moving to pro wrestling, what were your thoughts on SmackDown Tuesday night? I liked that show. I thought it was. I thought there was some cool stuff there. Um, I was Ziggler and Corbin was okay. I was kind of hoping it would get a little better, but it didn't. Um, but it was it was okay, and they, I think AJ at ringside and the way they pushed Corbin kind of built some intrigue. You know, they're really trying to make Corbin into a star, and we'll see. You know, we'll see if they can if it works. Um, the stuff with, I think the Miz and Renee Young thing worked really well. Everyone was talking about it. People thought it might have been real, which is amazing. Um, but that was good, and the um, Natalia and Nikki Bella thing. I mean, it was weird, and I think Natalia may have botched even a, a line. I'm not sure. The one about, like, you know, she said that, like, um, 
I think that she's supposed to say you're beautiful on the outside, but not on the inside. And then she says, you know, Nikki, you're beautiful on the inside and the outside. And it's like, what the hell are you trying to say? So, um, but but overall, I mean, when she went in there and they, you know, the whole thing of, you know, trying to do the thing in the big line about John Cena not marrying her and everything, you know, you throw reality in there. I always think it's good for, for wrestling when you use reality for your angles instead of fantasy. Because if people, be, you know, believe there's a thread to it, they take it a lot more seriously. And there was enough of that in there. So I thought that was pretty cool. Um, let's see what else is as far as on that show. Um, AJ and Ellsworth, very clear that they just wanted that thing over with. Um, and I don't know, with Ellsworth and Carmella, I mean, I know it's somebody's idea of a funny joke, but I don't know how funny it's really going to be. And Dean Ambrose and Luke Harper, they all beat. So the Wyatt family destroyed Dean Ambrose. But Miz is the one with the heat because the last scene was Miz laying him out with the skull crushing finale after he was already laid out. And Ambrose and Miz is very clearly the, the, um, the direction. So I was somebody should have, you know, done something with the Wyatts who's going to work with them. And I don't know who that is. But listen, listen, uh, Becky Lynch's typical stuff. It was fine. It's good. So, Mojo and uh, Kurt Hawkins was a time filler, obviously. So, um, but yeah, I thought that it was an easy show to watch. It was a good show. You have no comments on Dasha's interview with James Ellsworth? In what sense? That had to be the worst interview in the history of wrestling. Am I the only one? I don't know. I just thought it was something on the show that was stupid. But you know, I mean, it's like it's com it's it's comedy, and uh, you know, I don't. I, I mean, I think the Ellsworth thing. It's it's. I feel like it's gone too long, but you know, and it's obviously still going to go longer because they like it, and uh, you know, there he was, and they're going to do Car him and Carmel are going to have a romance, which I think. I don't know. It's, it's like their idea of funny. You know, oh, like this geeky guy with this pretty girl and ha, ha, ha. You know, so. 205 Live. Well, you know, you're, you're not going to get any heat in the matches, but the matches were very good. Uh, I thought Davari had his best outing so far when uh, he fought um, Lince Dorado. I thought that that, you know, there was no, no crowd heat at all. But he, he did a nice promo. He wrestled well in his match. Uh, obviously, they're building him up with for Gallagher. And they didn't do anything with him. Like, Gallagher didn't run in after him or anything like that. Um, Neville and Kendrick was what it should have been. Alexander and Gulick. I actually thought that, that um, the way that whole thing went down with um, Alicia Fox getting injured and everything, that, that Gulick should have won the match. It made Gulick look really bad that Alexander's distracted. Um, his girlfriend's hurt, and then he still comes back and wins anyway. Um, and then, you know, the the thing with um, Noam Dar helping Alicia. So they're trying to do a thing where he's hitting on her very publicly, and Alexander's really upset. Yeah, it was fine. And Perkins and Swan and Neville and Kendrick was a good match. Uh, Neville looked real good in there. And... Um, you know, again, not super heat or anything like that, but they still they did get the crowd by the end. It's just so hard, you know, when people are leaving and, and they've seen the stars that really you know, that's the problem that they need to address that for whatever reason they still haven't addressed it. I'm 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 surprised. I thought by like week three they would figure it out and they still haven't. Why did it take so long for them to figure out that Neville should be the star of the cruiserweight division? No, it wasn't that long. It was only a couple weeks. What are you talking about? The Cruiserweight Classic was months and months and months and months. Oh, well, that, but the Cruiserweight Classic was about introducing new people. So that, that doesn't bother me at all. Um, yeah, Neville and Aries, and Aries is probably going to be in there too. I mean, I, I would hope. So, yeah, they're getting they're doing what they should do with it now. You know, they're getting the guys. Those are the two key guys that I thought should be in there. Kalisto should be in there too. And they haven't done anything with him, but they need somebody for Baron Corbin to squash. So perhaps when they're done with that program, they'll put Kalisto in there as well. I don't know. Okay, the Cruiserweights debuted on Raw in September. The yeah. middle of September. Yeah. It's the end of December. Why did it take them three months to figure out that Neville 
should be well, a spotlight star of this cruiserweight division. I don't know. Um, seemed obvious to me. Uh, but they did. I'm, I'm not worried. It's only two months. It's no big deal. It's been three months. Anyway, ratings yeah, for Monday yeah. night. I mean, the ratings were, were good. The ratings were good across the board this week. SmackDown was very. SmackDown numbers were higher than I expected. Um, part of it was because there was no competition. I don't say no competition, but the networks were all in reruns, so there was a lot less competition than usual. So that helped. Um, Raw did well, you know, against an average football number, but it was it was up. I think partially from the you know day after the pay per view helped, but still it was it was it was by modern standards it was a decent Raw number for a show that was really not like it wasn't anything great as a show it didn't have a great hook or anything where you would go like where you would think the rating would be up i mean so so that was good the uh the ufc rating was very good which we talked about already but the the page fight ended up um probably over five million viewers um i don't have the number i mean it was the 15 minute segment which would have been the intro, the out, and a commercial break did 4.8 million viewers. So the match itself was probably well over five, which would put it in the top 15 of all time as far as uh, television MMA fights. Um, so that's that's pretty phenomenal. It was the third biggest uh, UFC show on Fox that didn't that was not a, that was not headlined by a championship fight. So that's a pretty impressive stat. It was, and the other ones were both the, the the two that beat it. One was one was um, a show that had uh, Phil Davis and Rashad Evans and Chael Sonnen and Michael Bisping, and both of them were to determine the Davis and um, Rashad fight was to determine who would face John Jones at the time when John Jones and Rashad was a super big fight, and Bisping and Silva Bisping and um, Chael was to determine who would face Anderson when Anderson and Chael which was after the first fight was a super big fight. So that was, uh, you know, that was a real high stakes show as far as, you know, the, you know, what was on that show. And then the other one was a Benson Henderson and Josh Thompson fight, which was also a number one contenders fight at lightweight. So, you know, this was, you know, what Michelle, I mean, Michelle Watterson and um, Paige, I mean, it was, you know, it, it, and and say I mean like Sage in the semi main, but it worked. I mean it was like, you know, this was the show was going to teach us a lot about what was what works as far as TV, and it taught us a lot. They want pretty people, and uh, people, people, you know, they don't have to be they don't have to be top ranked fighters, they don't have to win all their fights, they just have to be pretty, and uh, people will watch. Um, at least with Paige, um, and Paige lost. I you know, so. Not that nothing against Michelle Waterson. I mean, she's she's a pretty girl too, but pretty woman. But um, I mean, Paige is clearly was clearly the draw in that fight. And you know, I'm sure Uriah helped a decent amount, but still, those numbers grew greatly for Paige. So that tells me that you know the 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 big draw in that show was was Paige Van Zandt. Tokyo Dome. Oh yeah. So um, we were talking the other day about um, the different shows. Hold on, let me get to uh, where I was on that. So, yeah, we went up to 2006. So, so for the highlights of the Tokyo Domes after, so all of this stuff is now free on New Japan World. Um, and the last 10 years of Tokyo Domes, are there are some really great stuff. I mean, there's good, there's good stuff on the other one, but, but it really picks up, especially in the last, like, four years or so. But the, so the 2007 show... Has a couple of fights, well, has, has several matches that would be really intriguing. It's um, there was a Kawada Nakamura fight, which is kind of a battle of generations. Um, you know, Kawada was on his way out, Nakamura's on his way up, but those are like you know two two Hall of Famers against each other in what may have been, I don't know if it was their only singles match, but um, it was their highest profile singles match. And then there was Suzuki and Nagata. And Suzuki and Nagata is always a, a great match. And this was when Suzuki was Triple Crown Champion. So it was Nagata from New Japan going for the Triple Crown title. And then Tanahashi defending the IWGP against Taokea from, from um, All Japan. So this was, you know, one of the good things about the old Tokyo Dome shows that we don't have this year is when you get the guys from the other promotions in there. Like, you know, you had Kawada and um, 
Suzuki and Taioke especially, and you also had uh, Muto and Kojima on that show, because the main event was Muto and Shono reuniting as a team against Tenzan and Kojima reuniting as a team. So you had a lot of cross-promotional stuff on that show, um, you know, which we don't have now. 2008... So a lot of the 2008 show actually aired years ago on TNA. Um, there was Christian, AJ Styles, and Petey Williams against Milano Collection AT, Minoru Tanaka, and Prince Devitt, who was, of course, Finn Balor. Um, there was Wataru Inoue against Christopher Daniels. There was Team 3D against Makabe and Yano. Um, there was Muto against Goto. Uh, Giant Bernard and Travis Tomko against the Steiner Brothers. Uh, Steiner Brothers kind of on their way out by then. Very good match with Kurt Angle and um, Yuji Nagata for the for a version of the IWGP title, and then Nakamura Tanahashi for the IWGP title main event, which was you know it's Nakamura Tanahashi. It's a great match. Two thousand nine had Tanahashi and Mudo. Um, it had Nakamura and Goto against Misawa and Sugiura. So you have uh, Nakamura against Masao, another one of those generation matches. Um, Nagata and Masato Tanaka, which was a hell of a match. Again, you know, again, it's like... And um, Sabin and Shelley against Naito and Yutro, which was which was very good. And um, there was... Okada was in the opener. It was Okada, Yoshihashi, and Captain New Japan, all with different names, other than Okada, against Minoru... Milano Collection, sorry. Minoru and... Taichi, so they were in the opener. Uh, 2010 had Nakamura and Takiyama, Sugiura and Goto for the GHC title, Tanahashi and Goshiuzaki. Again, in, you know, interpromotional stuff. No, Mara Fuji against Tiger Mask. And then uh, an interesting one with uh, Terry Funk, the legends, Terry Funk, Joshu, Chono, Nakanishi against Abdul the Butcher, Toriyano, Izuka, and Ishii. So you got Ishii in there with guys like Terry Funk and Choshu. So that is definitely different. Um, and uh, Devin and Taguchi against Ultimo Guerrero and Averno. Uh, Okada, I think, is in the opener of that one, too, on that show. He is, but that was a quick match. 2011 was Tanahashi and Kojima for the Triple Crown, which was a great match. Um Makabe and Tanaka was a good match. Nakamura and Shiozaki was a good match. Jeff Hardy and Naito was a, a nothing match. That's not that good. Prince Devitt and Kota Ibushi, tremendous match. Nagata and Suzuki, tremendous match. Um, there was uh, Mosca Dorada and La Sombra against Liger and Hector Garza, which was very good. Um, Bernard and Anderson against James Storm and Bobby Roode and Nakanishi and Strongman. I think there was a... Oka oh, yeah. Sukiura and Takiyama against Goto and Okada. This is before Okada was a star. Uh, 2012 is when it really picked up. The Tanahashi Suzuki, which was great. Mudo and Naito, which was okay. Um, Shiozaki, Morafuji, and Nakamura and Yano, which was some good stuff. Uh, there was Funaki and, and uh, Kono against Nagata and Inoue. That was actually a short match. And Okada and Yoshihashi, which was not particularly that great. Uh, there's a uh, Devin and Taguchi against Davey Richards and Rocky Romero, which was pretty good. Um, yeah, so the um, Okada and Yoshihashi was not that good, but it was to get Okada over. So then, okay, so 2012 was uh, Tanahashi Okada, which was tremendous. Fantastic match. Nakamura and Sakuraba. You remember that one, don't you? Nakamura and Sakuraba? Oh, yeah. That match was tremendous. Uh, Makabe and Shibata was tremendous. Uh, Tenzan Kojima against Muto and Otani was, was good. Uh, Devitt, Loki, and Ibushi in a three-way was tremendous. Nagata and Suzuki was tremendous. Um, Tanaka and Shelton Benjamin was, was quick. Um, but yeah, those were the, that, yeah, that was a, 2000, so 2013 was a great show. 2014, uh, Tanahashi, Nakamura, and Okada and Naito. Now, these matches were very good, but, um, there was something missing in those two matches. I mean, they were really, really good. But um, Goto and Shibata was great, really great. And um, Ibushi and Devitt, you know, was was really good. Uh, Nagata Sakuraba against the Gracies. Remember that? Remember that match? Freaking 
Seem to recall it was hideous. It was hideous, yeah. But sometimes you want to, okay. And then uh, then 15, of course, Tanahashi Okada was great. Nakamura and Ibushi, which was um, one, maybe the best match ever at the Tokyo Dome. Certainly close. Nakamura and Ibushi and Tanahashi Okada's last two matches is Wrestle Kingdom 9. That's the one that Jim Ross announced. Um, that may have been the two best matches in a row on any wrestling show that I ever saw. If not, it's pretty close. And then AJ and Naito was really good. I mean, this whole show was great. Kenny Omega and Taguchi. Uh, Makabe and Ishii was was great. Suzuki and Sakuraba was, was pretty close to great. That's a killer show. And then, of course, last year, which may have been the show of the year, certainly in contention, the Okada Tanahashi, which may have been their best one they ever did. Nakamura and AJ, which was a fantastic match. Shibata and Ishii, which was a fantastic match. Um, Goto and Naito, which was very good. Um, uh, Kushida and Kenny Omega was very good. Uh, the Young Bucks four-way was very good. So, the, you know, so, like, so anyway, all of these matches are up now. They're for free, and uh, there's some awesome stuff in those last 10 years. All right, let's do some of the mailbag questions right here. This person says... At 1.4 million subscribers, has the WWE Network hit a near plateau considering international expansion is complete and overall WWE popularity is falling year over year? Um, they're doing a lot of gimmicks and stuff. I think that they'll be... I think growth is going to be a lot slower. Uh, it's going to be... It's just a, 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 you know, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, they're doing stuff like three months free and stuff. I don't. I don't know. Um, they seem, they, they, you know, they seem to go up January through March. I we're really gonna have a. I think we'll really have a real good idea after WrestleMania this year because I think they're gonna have a real strong WrestleMania. Um, but they had a real strong WrestleMania, you know, um, other years. I, I, you know, and I, I always, I always think they're gonna do better at WrestleMania than they end up doing every year. Uh, but it should be up a little bit. But, you know, as far as getting to 2 million subscribers, uh, I think it may take a couple may take a couple years. I think it will take a couple years to get to 2 million subscribers. This person here says... 4, mi four million is not, not happening anytime soon, to well, say the least. What are the specific contractual issues that are prohibiting matches involving Lesnar and Ogawa from being included on New Japan World? Um... Just the contracts that they signed. Um, both, I guess, threatened lawsuits over their matches, saying that their contracts don't allow it, and uh, everybody, nobody else is threatening to, to sue. Oh, well, actually, uh, um, I guess there must have been something with All Japan because some of those All Japan matches uh, from the February 10th, uh, 1990 show were taken off as well. So that may have been from, um, it's probably more from NTV because NTV's rival to T TV Asahi. And those guys were under contract to NTV. Um, Ogawa probably was on a loan from another company, and maybe maybe um, something to do with Anoki, and maybe Anoki didn't allow, or maybe Ogawa himself. I'm not really sure if it was Ogawa or Anoki. And Lesnar, I know, it was Lesnar himself. That Lesnar never gave the rights, you know, never gave up those rights. So they would have to pay extra, and they decided it's not worth paying extra to to get it. This person here says. Do you have any update on Styles, AJ Styles' possible Royal Rumble opponent? I don't know. I mean, I would think it's John Cena, but I think that we'll have a better idea. I mean, it's obviously they're going to AJ Styles and John Cena sometime relatively soon. This person here says, what's up with Mandy Rose? She hasn't been on NXT TV in weeks. I think she has more potential than a lot of the other women of her ilk. I agree. She's a better athlete than a lot of women of her ilk, and she's striking as hell. Um, I think that my gut, because she's still working all the house shows, my gut is that they're being smart with her because she is still really green, and I think that, but she, but she is a really good athlete, and I think the idea is probably the same thing I said with Liv Morgan that they didn't do because they're you know. Um, that these women have a chance to be stars, 
But if you throw them on TV when they can't wrestle, people start typecasting them as pretty girls who can't wrestle. And you really would rather have them typecast as beautiful women who are also really good wrestlers. So it's probably in their best interest to keep them off TV a little longer. That's kind of my thoughts. Um, so I don't know that that I don't know that that's their thoughts, but to me, if if it's someone like that, because the NXT goes so um, you know everyone sees it now or can see it, it's not like the old developmental. And I mean, one of the advantages of the old developmental was nobody saw it, so you could put them on TV and they're learning on the job, and it's okay because nobody sees it. There was a long period of time when. There were people who were going like, you know, well, this was back in OVW days and back in FCW days where there was like, you know, oh, maybe we should, you know, uh, try to get syndication for this stuff and try to get it on television. And at that time, the mentality from Vince was very strong. No, absolutely not. We don't want people seeing these people before they're ready to be seen. Um, obviously, you know, with a lot of people on NXT, that's not the case. But there's still that mentality of someone's if someone can be a big star. Um, probably keep them off TV until they're at least ready to be pushed so you don't have to, you know. So I think that that's probably what the thing is. But I, I'm sure they're high on, on Mandy Rose and because uh, it's, 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 it's pretty obvious that she could, she could be a star for sure. And um, like they did those athletic drills and she was like, of all the women down there, she took second in the athletic drills. And I've seen her when she's in the ring because she has been on TV a few times. And it's like, you can see the way she moves and, and the way she wrestles that, like, I mean, she's super green, but there's absolutely potential there. So, um, yeah, I think that's probably what it is. This person says, assuming he's not doing a match, is there any chance that the Rock's WrestleMania segment this year could be some kind of confrontation or angle with Conor McGregor? Get a ton of attention. Um I, for, for, I, I, I mean, yeah, there's a possibility, but, and I could see both of them wanting it, so I could see it. I almost think that it would be better for the company um, to have Connor work with someone on the roster, so that guy on the roster gets a rub. Because if it's Rock and Connor working with each other, it's kind of like, yeah, it gets you a lot of publicity, but nobody that you're relying on gets over from it because the rock's not going to be around from their year and Connor may never be around because how many times can you, you know, how many times are you going to pay millions of dollars for a Connor appearance? I mean, it's like it, 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 it means something the first time and the second time it's not really, it's not really necessarily even worth the money unless there's some incredible, you know, program. And obviously, obviously he can use his mouth and make an incredible program. It's not, it's not like somebody else where, you know, you're, you, you, you know, you, it's, you're limited in that way, but still, I don't know how many times they're going to be willing to do that. So I'm not even sure that they were, they're, they, they're willing to, you know, if it's, you know, there's, there's an argument that rock and Connor on the same show is overdoing it, that you only need one. You don't need both. So, um, especially because you already got, you've already got Shaquille O'Neal. You've already got undertaker rocks for sure. Doing the show or almost for sure. So, but I know that they, you know, I know that they want Connor. I know that they want Ronda. They, but, but, and, you know, just for the sake of the budget and for the sake of just not overloading it to where it doesn't mean anything, you know, when you look at that list, you don't want to make that list too big because if you make that list too big, you're just wasting, you're essentially just wasting money. So um, I don't know this is the right year for Connor, but I do know they're talking. So um, yeah, we, but yeah. I could see Rock wanting to work with Connor and do a verbal back and forth with Connor. Absolutely. I could see Connor loving to do that too. But I would rather keep him apart and 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 have Connor do something with I don't know who God, it's tough. Um who's like a you know, it's it's gotta be a great talker. I don't know if AJ's the guy um for Connor. Um Your main and, man Enzo Amore. No, that's a waste. I mean, it'd be fantastic, but it's not the, he's not the guy. Um, I haven't really thought about who the guy would be. I mean, Roman Reigns is not the guy. and I mean, I know that, you know, and he'll, and he'll have a bigger, he'll have a different match anyway. Um, yeah, I could, God, let's see, Triple H. But Triple H can work with Seth, so I don't think, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, hmm. Randy Orton's certainly not the guy. 
I keep thinking, you know, I don't think Dean Ambrose is the right guy. God damn. We don't got, we don't, we need like a, there's no Dusty Rhodes. Oh, well. No Ric Flair's. <laughs> there is no Dusty Rhodes or Ric Flair. There's no, there's no Dusty Rhodes or Ric Flair's. I mean, Ric, Ric Flair would be the guy. But not this year. Not, not, not Ric Flair today. Ric Flair of 25 years ago or 30 years ago. All right, everybody. On that note, we're going to wrap it up. The New Observer is up on the front page right now. Head up there and check that out. Last week's issue, if you haven't checked it out yet, was 